then let's start talking about Luigi Pirandello. Pirandello, oops, <laughs> as you now can no longer see, uh, is an Italian playwright. And the way he understands what he's doing, and the way that other people have understood what he's doing, are rather different. Interestingly enough, he did, at a variety of points, talk about his own artistry, about the play, uh, and specifically about the play we're going to be discussing today, Six Characters in Search of an Author. It was a dramatically new kind of play, and when he was asked why he wrote it, he said, oh, these characters just came into my head, and at first I didn't see how this made a play, I didn't see what to do with them, but somehow these characters were there in my mind, and just more and more forcefully pressed themselves on me, I felt compelled to tell their story. And so the manager in the play, uh, who finds these characters just wander again, basically that's Peter Delta, who suddenly finds these characters wandering in his mind when he's trying to work on something else, and he can't get rid of them. And so in the end, he writes this play to tell their story, but also to write that account of having these characters sort of impress themselves on his mind. And so he says, look, this is not an allegory. This is not about ideas. This is something that's about drama and about the power of the characters themselves. Hence this book, Drama is Actions, or Action and Not Confounding Philosophy. On the other hand, most critics of Pirandello think of his plays as plays that are all about ideas, where, yes, there are characters, often very dramatic situations. Nevertheless, it feels as though the main concern is really with the ideas, that he is a highly ideological playwright, not in the sense of some political ideology, but just in that ideas are driving the action more than the characters, more than the plot itself. Now, whose understanding is right? The critics or Pirandello's? Hard to say. Pirandello, here you see, working with some actors and actresses, um, is actually explaining the play. He was heavily involved in the theater, not just writing these things down, but actually putting on productions. He was, appropriately enough, born in a town called Chaos, Sicily. Uh, he ended up winning the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1934, about 13 years after this play was produced. There you see him in his typewriter, producing a play. Six Characters in Search of an Author was a dramatically new kind of play. It was written in 1921, uh, and first produced in 1921, so it appeared just after the end of the First World War. It was simultaneous with the publication of Wittgenstein's Tractatus with Eliot's The Wasteland, and so just a year after Gates' The Second Coming. So it's a play that reflects a kind of response to the disruptions of the war, as much as those works do. Uh, it was initially met with a great deal of hostility. The first production was in Rome. People couldn't believe it. After all, here they come in, and instead of seeing a play, and see a bunch of people sitting around rehearsing for a play, and then the rehearsal is disrupted by these characters that walk in off the street, people were utterly confused. And the theater quickly divided into those that were excited about the play and loved it, and those that hated it. There were shouts, madhouse, and things like that in the theater, and here riot broke out. Pirandello had to flee through a side exit. Uh, but then it was produced in Milan, and there it was a great success. In Milan, people thought this was new and exciting, a dramatic new way of doing drama. And so, ever since then, it's something that has actually inspired audiences. It's been put through many, many different productions. Uh, <laughs> there you see one of them. What kinds of themes appear in Pirandello's works? He is maybe uncharacteristic in actually talking quite explicitly about a lot of these themes and explaining them, indicating what he was thinking about when doing these drugs. So here is one thing, a theme of disappointment, a theme of the characters who do not live up to their ideals. In fact, at one point he says, the main theme in six characters is really the conflict between life and form. Now exactly what he means by life and what he means by form, I think it's hard to fully explain, that's why I didn't put it that way on the slide. But the form has to do with structures, both the characters' ideas themselves of what they have to be, and also society and its structures, the things that they feel that they have to fit into. And in both cases, he says, these things generate a disappointment. Life doesn't fit the form. Our individual characters don't fit the social forms that we're supposed to fit into. We're like square pegs that are people are trying to pound into round holes and it doesn't work. But it's only partly society, it's partly me ourselves. We have concepts of ourselves and we can't live up to our own ideas, our own concepts. So it isn't to be thought of as some external thing, as in Freud, let's say, civilization oppressing the id. Here it's more something that is happening within us. Now I suppose Freud could agree with that, it's the superego versus the id. But I think Pirandello has 
have something else in mind. We have ideas, we have a conception of what life ought to be, and we fail to live up to it. A second thing closely allied to that is the bankruptcy of social norms. This goes back to that square peg in a round hole idea. Society gives us certain ideas, it gives us certain norms of behavior. We've talked a lot about that, the various forms of normativity, of the oughts, of the shoulds, the goods, the bads, the virtues, the vicious, and so on. And a lot of the ways in which those get expressed and conveyed in society, these convinced are bankrupt. And so this is something that ties into the themes we've seen in other authors after the First World War, this sense that traditional norms, traditional social roles, all sorts of patterns really are bankrupt, are meaningless, are no longer of value, are hypocritical, that there's something fundamentally wrong with them. He shares that idea, that idea and thinks that these social norms Ah, uh, well, what? It's not exactly that they have to be reformed. He's not pushing some kind of political program. It's instead, rather, that the kinds of values that are upheld by society around us, or at least at his time, he finds morally not really worthy of the kind of respect that they command. He refers to a hopeless emptiness. He thinks of human life, in part, as hopeless and as empty. In this way, he really prefigures. Some authors will read later, the existentialists, who say, yes, in a sense, life is empty, and it's up to us to try to fill it. He looks around, tries to find something to give meaning to his existence, and can't find it. And so finds a kind of emptiness at the core of existence, um, an inability to hope. Think about those 19th century virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Here he's looking around saying, I don't see any grounds for faith. I don't see any grounds for hope. Charity, well, <laughs> that's something that he thinks there are grounds for, but quite different grounds from those that people have traditionally advanced. So, another important thing, reality is basically irrational. <laughs> now, he goes further in this respect than Freud. Freud says that there's a part of us that is fundamentally irrational. This creative force, this thing that is generating the wishes, that generating the dreams, the id, ultimately, he calls it in the short thing. <laughs> That's irrational, but on the other hand, the superego, the ego, are basically rational, and they have to deal with its demands and try to reconcile them with the superego and the world. Well, here, the thought is reality itself is irrational. It's not just that there's something in me that's basically an irrational force. In a sense, all philosophers have thought that. Plato had emotion and desire as basic parts of the soul. So that's not shocking that there's something irrational in us. What's shocking is the thought that reality itself is irrational that in the end you peel open the surface and what you see underneath doesn't make any sense. And that's overall a sort of continuing theme in Pirandello. It's not just that my plays don't make any sense, reality doesn't make any sense, life doesn't make any sense, nothing makes any sense. And so he really is an irrationalist in a very strong form. Not only is the world irrational, it really has no order, it's contradictory, and ultimately it's unknowable. So it's as if you peel back, you look inside, you see something that is unknowable, that doesn't make any sense, that seems to contain contradictions. You can't really put any structure on it. Well, the result of that is that life is really unpredictable, <laughs> and that it's impossible to be fully objective about it. It's impossible to anticipate things that are going to happen. The world is in some deep sense unknowable. Oh, see, it knew that. It shut off just at the right time. It's unknowable. I won't show you the slide. Really, that, what that means is, <laughs> or now, <laughs> really what they do is they set these things so that people can't steal these. But that means that you have five minutes or it shuts off. OK, the self. He has a certain conception of the self. And it really is one based on ambiguity. There is no clear identity of the self. Who are you? How can you answer that question? Well, of course, you could give me your name. <laughs> but suppose I say, wait a minute, yeah, I, forget the name. I want to know who you really are. Okay, what does your identity consist of? Now, that's a hard question. Suppose somebody were to ask that of me. So, yeah, you then want to tell me, who are you really deep down? I wouldn't know how to answer. How would you answer that sort of question? Right, some of you are shaking your heads if you don't, but I heard one person measuring an answer. What would you say? You're a human being. All right, that seems pretty safe. I'm a human being. Is there anything you can say beyond that? 
Yes. You're a student. Okay, good. What else? Funny. You're funny. Good. Ethnicity. You could describe your own ethnicity. Yeah, in my case, that's actually weirdly complicated. <laughs> Do we have consciousness, morals, and virtues? Oh, good. You have consciousness, you have morals, you have virtues. So you can think, yeah, look, I'm a conscious person. I, and then you might even list specific virtues. <coughs> I think of myself as being, you know, uh, friendly, uh, as being kind, as being generous, blah, blah, blah. You could fill in things you think characterize you. Well, in all of those cases, Pirinello was saying, yeah, those express ideals that you would like to live up to, or they <coughs> imply merely contingent facts about you, let's say, ones that really don't get at the question of who you really are inside. And he's worried that, in a certain sense, you can't really describe what you are, but rather what you aspire to be. You might say, look, I think I am a virtuous person. I'm kind, I think I'm generous, I think blah, blah, blah. And he'll say, man, then, yeah, that's what you want to be. That's the idea you have, but do you live up to it? Are you really always kind? Are you really always generous, always thoughtful, and so on? And part of the thought is, actually, all of us end up disappointed with ourselves. Maybe you're too young to be disappointed with yourself yet. Um, trust me, you will be. <laughs> you will realize that you don't really quite live up to the ideals that you espouse. But here's an, an interesting and, in a, in a sense, uh, more problematic idea. He says the conscious mind is a mask. It is a mask over something else. Now again, Freud would agree with that, a mask over the unconscious. But in this case, what's underneath is not just an id and a super ego and an ego or something like that that he gives you a theory of. No, for Pirandello, what's underneath that conscious mask is a mysterious multiplicity. So who am I really deep down? I am this turbulent, largely irrational, quite contradictory thing. There are multiple facets of who I am, and whatever I think and say consciously about that is really a simplification of this vast, complicated, mysterious reality that is me underneath. Moreover, he says the self is plastic. I adapt to different circumstances. I'm going to behave differently in different circumstances. Right now, I'm a professor, and so I behave in certain ways. But actually, my kids are quick to tell me if I start acting like a professor in other contexts. Once I stood up in a meeting and started saying something, and after I, afterwards I said, how did I do? My older daughter leaned over to me and said, you lecture them, you can say something. It's like you were a professor. And she didn't mean it kindly. <laughs> um, why? Well, she was basically saying, look, that was the wrong sort of role. You're supposed to be adapting to circumstances and you didn't quite do it. But in fact, we do that. We act differently in front of different sorts of people and we behave differently. We take on different identities. We wear different masks at different times. And so sometimes I'm acting as father. Sometimes I'm acting as professor. Sometimes I'm acting as philosopher uh, who is you know, presenting original ideas rather than somebody else's ideas. Sometimes I act as musician and I'm there going bom, 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 uh, or whatever it is. I have these different roles that I play. And those are different things. And so, in each case, there's a separate mask. And I take off and put on those masks, sometimes appropriately, sometimes inappropriately. I have mobile perspectives that I can take on. And in the end, when I look into myself, what I see is ultimately an illusion. In general, he says, I construct these masks for myself. And I construct conceptions of the world. But all of these, in the end, are really some distance away from that mysterious underlying reality. And so the best I can do is to come up with a series of illusions. Illusions for myself, illusions for the world, and some of them are better than others, some of them are more appropriate than others, but none of them really capture myself or reality the way it is. So here is the way he himself explains his ideas. I think that life is a very sad piece of buffoonery. <laughs> Because we have in ourselves, without being able to know why, wherefore, or whence, the need to deceive ourselves constantly by creating a reality, one for each and never the same for all, which from time to time is discovered to be vain and illusory. My art is full of bitter compassion for all those who deceive themselves. But this compassion cannot fail to be followed by the ferocious derision of destiny which condemns man to deception. So, we've talked a little bit about that ancient command, know thyself. Pirandello says, ha, impossible. We are inevitably engaged in self-deception. 
You cannot know yourself, he thinks. You are really always involved in deceiving yourself. You are never able to really look at the full reality of what you are, nor could you understand that if you did, actually, it would be unintelligible. So, what does he mean? Why is it that we're forced into self deception The characters in the play, in some cases, do terrible things, right? And they can't really come to face, come face to face with them. So they feel the need for self-deception. But why should you and I? Go ahead. To avoid cognitive dissonance between the ought and the is. Oh, I love it. To avoid cognitive dissonance between the ought and the is. Yes, exactly. There is the ought here and the is here. Not only in that grand sense of the manifest in scientific images, but in my own life, there is this conception of what I ought to be, those virtues that I would like to display and so on, and then who I really am. And there's inevitably a gap between those things. There is Dan Bodemack as Dan Bodemack wants to be, and there's Dan Bodemack as he really is. There is this gap. And can we face, at least for very long, the existence of that gap? No, we cover it up, we hide it. Occasionally, these masks slip, he says, and we're horrified by that, and we want to jump as quickly back into some mask as we can. And so what's going on here is there's a need for self-deception because we're constantly supposing that we are something other than who we are. In fact, we have to. We cannot understand who we are. It is too mysterious, too contradictory. So in the end, what is the conscious mind? It's a series of these illusions, a series of these masks. We construct them to hide a subconscious reality. That subconscious reality is intolerable. Why? Partly because it implies that we aren't what we think we are enough to be, and so we can't look at it for very long. That's the need for that self-deception. We look at it at a hidden level, and it's horrifying. But even apart from the horrifying aspect, it's contradictory, it's swirling, it's serious, it's ambiguous. It is, strictly speaking, irrational and unintelligible ones. So that's one aspect in which we sort of look behind the reference image and we see something unintelligible and mysterious and horrible. But also, no meaning is actually given to any things. Any things in the world, any things about ourselves, really everything takes on a meaning because we give it a meaning. And so, in the end, we are the authors of our own realities. The characters come in looking for an author. In part, that's how Ghirardello himself experiences it. Yeah, Bob, these characters pop up in his mind, and in effect, they were calling out to him to write about them. But partly, it's really that that's what we all do. This reality, as it is, is too confusing, too ambiguous, too multifaceted, too contradictory for us to really come to grips with. So we construct these illusions. We are the authors of our own realities, quote unquote, our own meanings, our own lives as we conceive them. Inevitably, that mask slips. We realize that these things are just illusions, that we are capturing ourselves or the worlds that really are. But at those moments, we confront the truth, but only briefly and not very far. We can bear to confront it only up to a point. So here are, <laughs> here are the six characters who are in search of an author, the father who has done this shameful thing, the stepdaughter that he has propositioned and tried to buy as a prostitute, and then the children who are disaffected and end up dead. Well, the play doesn't start with you thinking at all some of these characters are going to end up dead, and then it's a very deadly serious situation. It starts with these guys trying to produce a play by Pirandello called The Rules of the Game, and it looks like people are beginning a rehearsal for that. So the leading man at one point says to the manager, excuse me, but must I absolutely wear a cook's cap? The manager, oh, I, I imagine so, it says there anyway, he points to the book, the script. The leading man says, but it's ridiculous. Well, that's the way a lot of life is, it's ridiculous. And if you stop and think about it, you realize a lot of life is absurd. That too is a theme we're going to see again and again in the existentials. The manager jumps up in a rage. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Is it my fault that France won't send us any more good comedies? And we're used to putting on Pirandello's works <laughs> where nobody understands anything and where the author plays the fool with us all. Now this is within the play, right? So that's already pretty funny. Although I can see you're not really that amused by it. But anyway. The actors grin, the manager goes up to the leading man, and he shouts, yes sir, you put on the cook's cap and beat eggs. 
Do you suppose with all this egg beating business you're on an ordinary stage? Get that out of your head. You represent the shell of the eggs you're beating. Okay, they all laugh. Now, what on earth does that mean? You represent the shell of the eggs you are beating. Yeah, right. I hope you were broken Yeah, exactly. The, the, the goo of the egg inside is like that hidden reality of you. And there is like a broken self here. Look at that broken egg, right? I mean, it's like you once the mask has slipped and once you look at the goo inside. Uh, and so you could think, yes, precisely. Who we are, who we think of ourselves as. That's like the shell of this egg. But the hidden reality is the egg, which is really formless, un confusing, unintelligible to us, and so we, we really are like the shells of the eggs. We are, our identities are something like that shell over an unintelligible and sort of formless reality. And there we are beating them up. Okay. <laughs> That's one analogy, anyway, that appears here early in the play for this basic view of the human condition. It's not just a joke. It really is a metaphor for the way things life is. Here's another one. Silence, listen to my explanation, please. And he says to the leading man, the empty form of reason without the fullness of instinct, which is blind. You stand for reason, your wife is instinct. It's mixing up the parts according to which you, who act your own part, become the puppet of yourself. Do you understand? The leading man says, I'm hanging my tooth. The man is says, well, leave me alone. But let's get on with it. It's sure to be a glorious failure anyway. Now, look at those two statements. <laughs> The empty form of reason without the fullness of instinct, which is blind. What on earth is going on here? Oops. I thought I had a picture of a puppet, but I don't know. The empty form of reason without the fullness of instinct, which is blind. What does he mean by saying instinct is blind? Or is it the empty form of reason that's blind? What's blind? Well, let's go to the second The second part. <laughs> you, who act your own part, become the puppet of yourself. What is he saying? Yeah. Everything you do is controlled by something within you. It's not actually what you think you are. Good. Every, yes, exactly. You're projecting a certain image on the world. So everything that you appear to be, every role you take on, is really uh, something like a part you're acting. Exactly. So really, you become the puppet of yourself. You're acting in a certain role. You're putting on that mask. You're taking on that identity or that aspect of your identity. And so you are like the puppet master inside. And the form of you, this identity you take on, is something like a puppet. You're really the puppet of yourself in the sense that you're simply taking on these forms, taking on these masks, these roles, these illusions. But they aren't really who you are. And so there is a sense in which each of us is acting his own part. Really, you're like an actor in a role more than you are simply a person being authentic. In fact, if you want to tie this to nature, remember he said, here is the basic rule. I am become the person I am. Peter Dello stops at that too. Not for the reason that Dostoevsky does, because it's narcissistic, quite for a different reason. There is no such thing as what is you. <laughs> okay, the person you are is this confusing, ambiguous, irrational mess. And so to become that, that's impossible, actually. You can't become that. You couldn't bear to become it, even if it were possible. And so, in the end, we have no option but to act our own part. In other words, he's saying authenticity is impossible. Everything you project about it yourself, every role you take on, every identity you project, is really a part you're acting. There is no such thing as just being you. Just be yourself. Pirinello basically says, impossible. All we can do is actually act, take on roles. We are acting our own parts. We are the puppets of ourselves. And if you say, stop being the puppet, let me just see the real you. There is no real you. Or let me put it this way, no real you that anyone can understand. You're just a mess. You're like the eggs of the yolk. You're just this sort of hidden, contradictory, confusing, ambiguous mess. So, now back to the form of reason, the empty form of reason. Well, reason is talking about those forms, about those illusions, about those constructions, those roles, those identities we take on. 
But that's really empty. In a sense, that's not who we are. What we are is more like instinct. But ultimately, those instincts are irrational and unintelligible. Now, <laughs> the characters come in. And at first, it's confusing. They seem to be lost. But then they say, we're the characters, and we're in search of an author. And at first, the manager says, we're not putting on a new play here. The author is here. You're down here. And they say, no, no, you don't understand. We have a story, and we need somebody to tell our story. The manager says, we you oblige me by going away? You don't have time to mess with mad people. And the father, maliciously, oh, sir, you know well that life is full of infinite absurdities, which, strangely enough, don't even need to appear plausible, since they are true. Now, infinite absurdities, they don't have to seem plausible, they're true. What on earth is he? What absurdities? What kinds of absurdities is life full of? Moments when you think of things as irrational. You look around and nothing suddenly makes any sense. Later, Albert Camus is going to talk about these as absurd walls that we run into, where suddenly we confront the absurdity of existence, where nothing makes any sense anymore. And Pierre Bellow's point is, yeah, we do confront that. But it's really we quickly shy away from it and we reimpose some mask to try to give it some intelligibility. But there are moments when the masks slip, moments when it does look like life is absurd. Now, give me some examples. Have you ever had that feeling that life is absurd? That the situation you're facing is absurd? That somehow none of this makes any sense? What are situations like that? That life is more expensive than water? That diamonds are more expensive than water? But you need water to live. You need water to live. Oh, I get it, okay. <laughs> Sorry, it took me a minute. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, good. You think of the price of things. And, well, actually, in Texas, water is pretty expensive. In most of the country, I tell people what we're paying every month for water, and they say, no, you mean in here, right? And they say, no, every month. Uh, but still, it's cheap compared to diamonds. And then you can think, well, people do need water, but they don't need a diamond. Now, of course, part of it is the supply part of supply of demand. There aren't many diamonds, there's lots of water. But in part, you might think, yeah, wait a minute, why do we value certain things? Why are diamonds so valuable? Why is that costly to get a diamond? And you might think that doesn't make any sense. Nobody needs one of these outside of a few industrial uses and so on. So why are we this? And that can look absurd. In general, why we value certain things far over others might seem absurd. I have an old VW that I've been driving. It's not worth very much. Uh, and yet, I have a friend who has a BMW, an M6, paying over $100,000 for it. But actually, if I look at the quality of the cars, I like mine just as well as I like this. I mean, I've heard of it. It's pretty awesome. But I draw mine all the time, and it's awesome too. <laughs> and so I look at this and think, wait, why is that $100,000? And this, you know, maybe $1,000. What the hoop? What's, you know, why? They, they look to me, and we'll look to an alien from Mars as if they're equally good. What's the deal? And so things like that can start looking absurd. Other examples. Yeah. Currency. Currency. Yes, okay, good. Uh, I want something, let's say I want a new computer, or I want a big screen TV, or I want a new car. I produce little sheets of paper. And people actually trade me things of real value in these little sheets of paper. I mean, look at this. Here in my wallet, I have a $20 bill. And I will buy real things. But well, I have lots of other sheets of paper in here. Um, I have here a really tattered insurance card. I have here a really tattered bus schedule. If I say, we need a car to do this, nobody does it. And so why is one sheet of paper very valuable and the other is not at all? I don't know. Good question. Anyway, that's, that might strike you as absurd. Can you think of other cases like that? Yeah. Death. Death. Yes. Okay, death might seem absurd. Let's say, I mean, it might be your own death you're thinking about, but it could be that somebody else dies, let's say. You hear about somebody's death, and you think, what is this all about anyway? In fact, the existentialists will end up saying, yeah, it's really death that is the ultimate confrontation with this absurdity. What does it really mean? Theologians have thought for centuries about the problem of evil. If there's a good God, why does evil exist in the world? And I think in a lot of ways, that question comes down to the question, why there is death? Why do people die? Um, why do animals die? Where does death come from? And how can it make any sense? And you might think, look, here's the way in which it challenges everything else about life. 
You can have all sorts of ideas that you think are not at all absurd. Bad things you really value, the good of humanity. You can love certain things, you can love people, and yet in the end, you end up dead. <laughs> no matter whether you're a good person or a bad person, whether you've loved or not, whether you've been loved or not, you might think, wow, in the end, death cancels it all out. It makes everything else seem absurd. And so, you're right, death is one of the things that thinkers following in Pierre Bernal's footsteps think of as sort of the ultimate sign of absurdity. Well, for these and for all sorts of other reasons, Pirandello thinks, yes, in the end, we really do confront a fundamentally irrational, absurd existence. And so it's not just that these absurdities are stemming from us, like an id that is irrational, putting some sort of taint on things. No, the world itself is like that. These things are actually true. <laughs> yes, there you are confronting the absurd. Camus also talks about absurd doors. Well, there one is. <laughs> Okay, that's a philosophy joke. I can see you eat my bread. Yeah, well, the manager says, what the devil is he talking about? The father continues, I say that to reverse the ordinary process may well be considered a madness. That is to create credible situations in order that they may appear true. But permit me to observe that this be madness is the sole raison d'etre of your profession, gentlemen. Well, the actors are hurt and perplexed. And so they're very sad that he seems to be calling them mad. <laughs> And he says, wait a minute. The manager says, so our profession is one worthy of madmen then? The father says, well, it may seem true, that which isn't true, without any need for a joke as a perk. Isn't that your mission, gentlemen, to give life to fantastic characters on the stage? In other words, here you are on the stage, your whole point is to put on fictions and act as if they're true. Well, isn't that crazy? <laughs> so don't yell at me as a character and claim I'm crazy. What you're doing is the definition of craziness. So here we get the six characters in another production. The stepdaughter there on the left, the mother who has very little to say, the child who is obviously older than the three or four suggested in the script. <laughs> but anyway, here's what's really driving the father's thought. He says, each of us, when he appears before his fellows, is clothed in a certain dignity. But every man knows what unconfessable things pass within the secrecy of his own heart. One gives way to the temptation only to rise from it again afterwards, with a great eagerness to reestablish one's dignity, as if it were a tombstone to place on the grave of one's shame, and in a monument to hide and sign the memory of our weaknesses. Everybody's in the same case. Some folks have the courage to say certain things. That's all. So his idea is really there are unconfessable things that pass inside everybody's heart. We have to hide from who, who we truly are. To put it in terms of Freud, the id wants what it wants, and the conscious mind takes some of those and won't burn them into consciousness. I shouldn't really say the conscious mind, the sensor here, I guess in the mature theory of superego, says, whoa, some of you guys, get back down here. I can't allow this to be expressed. Others, uh, I'll allow it, but only if we disguise you so that it doesn't look like what you are. And so, in the end, there are uncontestable things in each of our hearts. Here and those difference is that he thinks, in a sense, we're aware of a lot of these. Maybe there are some we're unaware of, as in Freud, but a lot of these we're aware of. If we really had someone say to us, let's say they give us a truth so, and start asking us embarrassing questions, all of us could be embarrassed. Actually, it used to be truth serum, and you know, if you really confess every thought in your heart, now I can say, if somebody were able to hack your Google search, <laughs> there would be something embarrassing. Uh, in, for, for basically everybody. And so, there are things that are unconfessable. I could say, so give me some examples, except the whole point is they're unconfessable. You wouldn't be willing to say them. And so each of us is like that. He says, really, there is something inside of our lives, lots of things inside of our lives that we wouldn't want to admit to. Some of these might just be hidden thoughts, hidden desires, but some of them might be actions, things we've done we're ashamed of and we would never want anyone to know. Now, the stepdaughter, who is clearly hostile to the father throughout this, says, all appear to have the courage to do them, though. And she's thinking, of course, of him. He says, yes, but in secret. Therefore, you want more courage to say these things. Let a man that speak these things out and folks at once label him a sin. But it isn't true. He's like all the others. Better would be because he isn't afraid to reveal with the light of the intelligence, the red shame of human bestiality on which most men close their eyes so as not to see it. In other words, there are these unconfessable things, and at least the father has the courage to say that. 
Now, he's not confessing any of the Christian ones. He's not that courageous. But he is saying there are unconfessable things. Everybody else is trying to hide that fact and act as if it's not so. Now, when he says this, the stepmother is disgusting. And she says, oh, all these intellectual complications make me sick, disgust me. All this philosophy <laughs> that uncovers the beast in man and then seeks to save him. Excuse me. I can't stand it, sir. When a man seeks to simplify life, beastly, throwing aside every breath of humanity, every chaste aspiration, every pure feeling, all sense of ideality, duty, mercy, <coughs> shame, then nothing is more revolting and nauseous than a certain kind of remorse, crocodile's tears, that's what it is. So she's basically accusing the father of a kind of self-deception. He's trying to excuse his own bestiality. What he did by saying, well, look, everybody's really the same underneath. Everybody has these unconfessable things. And so really, the courage is in, the virtue is in admitting that. And she said, give me a break. Don't think that by saying that, you can get yourself off of These things are still terrible and for me. So there's a large question in the background. Is redemption even possible? If that's true, if everybody has unconfessable things in their own heart, and saying that is no help. <laughs> then is there anything that can help? Well, I think Pirandello's answer is no. In the end, we just have to hide from ourselves. The drama lies in this, the father answers, in the conscience that I have, in each one of, that each one of us has. We believe this conscience to be a single thing, but it's many-sided. There is one for this person and another for that. Diverse consciences. So here he's really saying something interesting about Freud's idea of the superego. Is there such a thing as the superego? Let's think back to Freud. What is the superego? In something like your conscience, it is giving you rules, it's laying down the moral law. It is the internal thing that takes the place of your parents and telling you what's right and wrong, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And in this case, he's saying two things about what I think. It's doubly worse. One is that it's different in you from in me. It's not as if the superego acts the same way and gives the same commands in each one of us. But the second point is that even within each one of us, it really isn't just one unified thing. If you want to put it in Freudian terms, he's saying the superego doesn't have its act together. It's really many faceted, many sided. I have the superego telling me one thing in one context and another thing in another context. And in fact, I've noticed that in this season of the beginnings of a presidential campaign, when there are all sorts of political memes on my Facebook account, and so on, on both sides, I find a lot of people accusing people on the other side of a certain kind of hypocrisy. Wait, you know, you are, you are all pro-life and all that, but in favor of capital punishment, and in favor of people possessing guns, and the person on the other side says, well, wait, you think it's not okay to kill the guilty, but you think it's okay to kill the innocent? And there are all these things. And in a certain sense, you could say, Peter Nello would say, and they're all right. <laughs> that is to say, we're all hypocritical about these things because our consciences aren't very consistent. We look at this kind of situation and we say, oh, that seems right to me. This thing seems wrong. And is there one conscience that's really giving a consistent set of rules for all of this? No, it's highly context dependent, highly driven by a particular situation, the particular illusion we've constructed at that moment, the particular mask we're wearing. And so actually, Pirandello would sort of say, yeah, you know, <laughs> all of us have opinions that actually on these things don't really add up to anything coherent. They're highly contradictory. There isn't really one conscience, even within me, that has to act together, much less having our act together socially together. We not only disagree a lot with each other, we disagree a lot within ourselves. In the end, our opinions about these things don't make much difference. Really, that's something like what we are. This bunch of masks, which I sometimes put on, sometimes take off, and try not to let slip so that people see the real nature of the reality underneath. More masks. Creepier masks. <laughs> so, this illusion of being one person, he says, is just an illusion. Having a personality that's unique in all racks, it isn't true. There is no one thing that is you. So who are you really? There's no way to answer that in part because there's no you. There's just a bunch of stuff going on in there. You had this idea that there really is no self. There's just a bunch of thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. We bundle them up and call those a self. In fact, 
Hugh at one point says the self is like a tear, in which all of this stuff is going on. And I think the echo of that thought is here in Pirandello. We have the illusion of being one unified self, but it's not true. We perceive this when tragically, perhaps, in something we do, we are as if we're suspended, caught up in the air on a kind of foot. Then we perceive that all of us was not in that act, that it would be an atrocious injustice to judge us by that action alone, as if our existence were summed up in that one being. Think about the people whose lives have been summed up in history by one being. Who are some people like that? Who are really remembered for one thing? Hitler. Well, Hitler, yeah. Actually, there were many things, but yes, uh, you might say, well, I think I'll let up on one big thing, maybe. Um, other instances of somebody, you really know one thing about it. That defines who they are. John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth, yeah. He shot Abraham Lincoln. What else do you know about it? I mean, probably did very little. He, he's an actor. Um, he shot him the Virginia City Bottom, six separate trials after the assassination. Um, but yeah, most people don't know a whole lot about him. And so you can think, well, okay, yeah, he, his act gets summed up in one knee. But is that fair? Who was he really? Well, yeah, he did that. That's, not, that's false. But I think each of us would be appalled to think that we're remembered for one thing. Okay? Even if it's a good thing, you might think, I'm a lot more than that one thing. Gabriel Prince, remember, remembered for assassinating the Archduke. Um, Gosh, there are all sorts of one-hit wonders, <laughs> right? Who are remembered for one thing. Steve, the Medicaid man, remembered that one song. They never, as far as I know, did anything else. Well, gosh, but still, you hear that song time sometimes. It's like, that's remembered. But that's all we come down to. And so you might think, whoa, wait a minute. We end up getting summarized in one D? But in fact, we're highly complex, highly ambiguous. There's a whole set of masks we put on. Well, what about human relationships? That's the point of this slide. It's not just that we do all this individually, we actually have to interact. But if we're really multiplicities and we're hiding our true natures, how is communication possible? How are human relationships possible? How is love possible? Well, it's a problem. <laughs> the father says we find ourselves strange to one another. We find we're living in an atmosphere of mortal desolation. Which is the revenge, as he, pointing to the sun, scornfully said of the demon of experiment that unfortunately hides in me. If I'm constantly hiding who I am from myself, like, how can I reveal it to you? How can we really relate to one another? How is true friendship, true love possible? Pirandello seems to be implying it isn't possible. But still, we find ways of trying to substitute for it. We say when faith is lacking, it's impossible to create certain states of happiness. We lack the necessary humility. We try to substitute ourselves for this faith. They need it here. Creating for the rest of the world a reality which we believe after their fashion, while actually it doesn't exist. For each one of us has his own reality to be respected before God, even when it's harmful to one's very self. Each of us creates our own reality. Each of us creates this understanding not only of ourselves, but of the entire world. So the father at some point turns to the manager and says, you, you have to be the author. He says, what are you talking about? I've never been an author. But Pirandello's point is, we all are authors. We are all the authors of our own reality. Why not turn author now? Everyone does it. Everybody is in this position of acting as the author for their own reality. So in the end, acting how you really are, that's impossible. You're making up. <laughs> your life as you go, you're acting as its author. There is no hidden reality inside you have to match. We can tolerate the truth, he says, up to a point, but no further. So his view is that the truth is impossible. It's rather that we only get limited glimpses of the truth, because we can only glimpse reality in a limited way. In the end, the true nature of reality is highly contradictory and goes way beyond anything our intellect can have. Next time we'll look at the wild and crazy irrational artistic